Hello and welcome to today's webinar on creating a genealogical research plan. My name is Ginevra Morse, the Director of Education and Online Programs here at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'll be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer this webinar today for our members and friends around the world. Giving today's presentation is Lindsay Fulton, Director of Research Services at NEHGS. Lindsay joined the Society in 2012, first as a member of the Research Services team and then as a genealogist in the library. In addition to helping constituents with their research, Lindsay has also authored a portable genealogist on the topics of applying to lineage societies, the United States Federal Census 1790 to 1840, and the United States Federal Census 1850 to 1940. She is a frequent contributor to the NEHGS blog Vita Brevis and has appeared as a guest on the Extreme Genes radio program. Her areas of expertise include New England and New York research with a focus on lineage society applications. So uh, with, as you know, with all of the genealogical information at your fingertips today, it's really easy to become overwhelmed, go down research rabbit holes, and lose focus. So after reviewing a few important genealogical basics um, today, Lindsay will provide a step-by-step -step approach to creating a research plan and sticking to it. Throughout the presentation, she'll be calling upon some best practices used by the research services team here at NEHGS, and she'll also be using templates, worksheets, and other research tools available at AmericanAncestors.org. Org. Lindsay will demonstrate these steps using a case study from her own family history. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to write a question in the panel to the right of your screen. Lindsay will answer as many as she can in the time provided. We will be selecting questions that are more general in nature, so please consider that when submitting your query. There is no handout for today's webinar, but starting tomorrow, you'll be able to watch a recording of this presentation on our website. So don't worry if you miss something on today's first listen or you need to hear it again. Uh, you will be able to go back and um, and review today's content. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Lindsay. Thank you, Ginevra. Thank you, Ginevra. So welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar on creating a research plan. Uh, we have a lot to cover, but I think that this will be an important lesson in perfecting your own uh, genealogical research and your own genealogical skills. It will help you to avoid those shiny objects um, and come up with a systematic approach to solving a research problem. Uh, as Director of Research Services, we daily discuss the best practices to be more productive with our uh, research time. So I'm happy to share some of these uh, tips and tricks with you today. So an important concept for everyone to, um, to understand is that our finished research does not appear out of nowhere, just like this iceberg here. Um, so our completed pretty chart is built on the information that we were able to gather. Um, so when we were educating ourselves, when we're organizing ourselves, and when we're doing careful research, this helps us to create the best final product possible. Um, and the best way to do all of these three research functions is to create a plan, and that's what we're going to do today. So using education, organization, and careful research, we're going to create a research plan that will be uh, the best that we can build. Before I go through the steps of creating a research plan, though, I want, every, I want to reiterate two important genealogical principles. One is to work from the known and go to the unknown. This is very important. We don't want to skip over generations. We don't want to assume that we are related to Richard Warren of the Mayflower if our last name is Warren. We need to do the research to get to that point, um, starting with the most recent generation and then moving backwards. And something that I'm going to reiterate over and over today is that we need to write everything down. We need to write it down. You are not going to remember everything that you find during this uh, research process. Okay, so first step, 
Uh, whether you've been researching for 10 years or you're starting today, you must get organized and you must stay organized. Uh, it's one of the hardest practices in genealogy, but I promise you, you won't be upset when you're looking at a record for the first time rather than the fourth time. So we want to stay organized. That's our, our first step. Some ways to help us do this. Uh, so there's, there's two items that we're going to talk about uh, right now in terms of organization. One is what we call a research log, and the other is something that I refer to as a data sheet. Uh, so, so the first thing we're going to discuss is a research log. And you should always begin with this whenever you're trying to tackle a research uh, problem. This is an example of a research log that's available as a template at AmericanAncestors.org. You'll notice that the log allows you to make note of the repository, as well as the date that you are performing this research, as well as the source information, the call number, which is important because that will help you get back to this uh, information if you need to do that in the future. Uh, it includes a column for your objective, and the objective section is very nice because it forces you to stay on task by writing down what you're actually looking for. Uh, and then we have this final comment column here, which is the result. Again, very helpful, uh, especially to include information that you were able to find or not find, because uh, that will help you in the future rather than you don't want to be looking at a record over and over again. Now, I mentioned that you can download uh, the template, the, the research log template at American Ancestors. You can do that at this URL, AmericanAncestors.org slash education slash learning resources slash download. There are several templates here. One of them is a research log, and the other uh, is a five generation chart and family group sheet, which we will discuss uh, momentarily. Another research log, and this is the one that we're going to talk about and use today, uh, and this is because I, I like the way that, that, that this research log lets us um, kind of roll with the punches as we're researching. Uh, but if you like to use something different, a little bit different, you can use those uh, different logs as long as you promise me that you're going to write stuff down as you're researching. That is the most important um, element of today's discussion. So the reason that I like these annotated research logs is so I build these in uh, Excel. And the reason that they're so lovely is that it gives you the option of adding columns. So if you want to start with uh, census records, you can include that as a um, divider there and then include all of the census records that you're looking for after that. Uh, and if during the research process you find that you want to be looking for the 1930 census, you can include that um, as, as a step going forward. You'll also have a place to put in names or variant spellings, as well as a date examined. Again, I made up all of these columns, but we've seen that these are the ones that, these are the columns that we use most often. Uh, place, informa place information, as well as whether we're finding a relevant record. Again, very important in this process, especially if you are not finding a record, uh, because then you will know that you've already looked for something and that you shouldn't return to that. Another nice uh, column that we have here is the notes column. That will allow you to maybe draw attention to something that may be on that record that you shouldn't be looking at at this exact moment because it's not helping you answer your specific research question, but it may be helpful in the future. So in this case, we're, we're just mentioning that there's two other Russian households um, that are on the same census as this uh, John Russian in 1880. So next, we're going to organize our data, and that's when we're going to use data sheets. Um, as, and as I said before, this is going to be the, the second part in, in organizing yourself. So you're going to have a log, and you're going to have a data sheet. There are several styles of data sheets. There's a family group sheet. There's a five-generation chart. You can customize your own spreadsheet. You can use a genealogical software or a database software. Whatever you decide to use, that is fine. You just should stick to that one format and not use several different types of um, data sheets. So some examples of this, uh, so I'll show you a five generation chart. This is some information uh, on my own family. So this gives you the option of starting with yourself as number one, 
um, and then including the information for your parents as two and three. And there are lines for um, birth information, marriage information, and death information, which you can include both the date and the location. It allows you to put your uh, grandparents as well as your great-grandparents and your great-great-grandparents. Now, if you want to continue, you can do so. So you'll see that example, uh, you'll see this chart number here. So you can uh, number the charts, the, the people who are, are going to be going further here. So for example, if we wanted to continue on with Edward Ambrosi, which is number 24 here, we could just put chart number 10 because this would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So he would be the 10th chart. Um, so then you could start a new five generation chart beginning with Edward Ambrosi and then putting his parents, um, grandparents, and so on and so forth. Uh, family group sheets can also be a great way to keep your family research organized. Um, I think they're a great way to keep track of key surnames, like a wife's maiden name or the married uh, surnames of daughters, because these sheets let you fill in a little bit of information for the wife and children. However, these sheets can get very lengthy, uh, and you may feel overwhelmed by the number of sheets in your research folder. Um, therefore, I recommend for a deep dive into a family, um, a family using these group sheets, I would, I would recommend actually using a genealogical software other than these group sheets. But if you're just looking at one family and you want to write everything down, maybe you're going to a, a library and you don't want to take your computer with you, uh, this might be a good option for you. As I mentioned, uh, genealogical software, that helps you take a deep dive into uh, families because it it expands beyond that five generation chart where we're just including birth, marriage, and death information. Um, and it, it can expand beyond that. So if there's military uh, service, you can include that information. Um, if, if someone was involved in a fraternal organization, you can include that information. There's many more um, um, features that you can fill in on these genealogical software programs. Uh, this is just a list of some of the most popular However, if you're interested in, if you don't have a genealogical uh, software program that you use and you're interested in choosing one, I'm going to recommend, because I am not an expert in genealogical software, to, re to uh, listen to Rhonda McClure's Choosing a Genealogical Software Program, which is available at American Ancestors. Uh, it was a webinar that was given but it's also, it was given in January of 2016. Uh, but this is something that would be part of our archived program. So you can uh, look at that at the following hyperlink on the bottom there. Okay, so once we've organized ourselves, the next thing that we need to do is uh, include information about what we know about our ancestors and then what is missing because we always want to work from the known to the unknown. So we can look over our data sheets for missing information. So if we return to the five generation chart or your group sheet, you can look to see what information is missing. Now on this one in, in particular, there's a lot of information, information that's missing. We see a lot of blank lines here. Uh, but for the, for the case study that we're going to do later, we're going to examine the life of William Henry Brown but you want to be looking at those lines for that particular missing information before moving forward. And something to think about, um, you know, the, so, so some of the information that you, that you might be missing is like a birth date or a place, a marriage date or a place, but we shouldn't only be concerned with missing information. We should be concerned about certain missing information. So what do you want to know? That's what's most important then you can start moving on to these other items that are listed here. So immigration year, naturalization status, uh, you know, that might apply to your ancestor, but if that's not something that you're interested in, in figuring out at this exact moment, then maybe pick one of the items on here to discover. So if we're looking for parents' names, let's just focus on, on that particular issue. All right, now step three. Once you've determined what you're missing, in terms of information and what you want to know more about, this is the most important step, you must list the records that will aid in your research. This will keep you on track. This will keep you from looking at the shiny objects that you find while you're researching. 
if you have a list of items that you need to find and that you need to cross off you know your log this is the best way to do it so listing those records that are going to help you in your research so what are those types of records we need to be looking for vital records church records census records taxation records um, we also want to be considering are these records going to tell us the information that we need to know so for example is a census record going to tell you about a person's religion well that depends if we're looking at a united states census record probably not uh, unless that person was involved in um, the ministry but if we are looking at a Canadian census, they do identify people's religion on that. So in that case, that might help us to identify church records for a particular individual. So you have to know about the record that you're looking for and whether or not that record is actually going to tell you the, the information that you're looking for. A fantastic way of doing this um, is to review a chart that Ann Lothers, uh, she's a genealogist here on the staff at NEHGS, she created this for those who are getting started. However, I think that this is something that can be useful across the board, whether you're new to genealogy or if you're an expert. Um, it helps you to stay on track, and it also might give you insight on a different research approach. So you might not have thought about, for example, a death place uh, and a death date in place. You might not have thought about looking for a newspaper. You might not have thought of looking for a military record. So this chart will, will give you a systematic approach to finding that information that you're trying to discover about your ancestor. And I mentioned that you can find that chart uh, done by Ann Lothers on our website. This is under the uh, education tab here. Um, and there's several different types of charts in addition to the one that I just mentioned, um, that can help you to systematically approach a research problem. Okay, so once we've identified the type of record that you're looking for that will help you to solve your genealogical problem, you will then need to determine where that record is actually located. So is it at a local repository? Is it on AmericanAncestors.org? Is it at the local town hall? you will be responsible for educating yourself on the location of these records. So to do so, you should re locate re reference materials on the particular type of record that you're looking for. For example, there are several books that are written about the federal census, state census records, and vital records. These can be most helpful when compiling a list of the records that you need to check on your research log. Because again, we're going to add all of these things to our research log as we're discovering them. Some repositories to check for reference materials uh, are our own library here at NEHGS. You can do so by searching our online catalog using either the keyword tab, the title tab, author, subject, call number, or even this advanced tab here. And that's a, the advanced tab is a nice way to look for manuscripts that we have in our collection. Um, but you can search the library catalog to discover some reference materials that we might have about a particular record group that you're interested in. Another way that you can search for reference materials is using uh, WorldCat. WorldCat's one of my, my all-time favorite um, resources available. Uh, you can search WorldCat using your zip code, and it will tell you the local libraries that are carrying a book that you're looking for. Um, and if you cannot find a local library, sometimes you can use uh, interlibrary loan to through your local library um, to get a hold of some of those reference materials. Finally, some other books that you might be able to find are using eBooks online. These are some of the more popular of the um, ebook sites, either through Hathi Trust, Google Books, um, Archive.org, Open Library. FamilySearch has done a significant job uh, digitizing their collection as of late, so you could check the FamilySearch.org uh, for a ebook in your area. So, in addition to those reference materials, there are some major sites that have compiled subject guides about specific genealogical material. 
um, American Ancestors has many to choose from. So this is just this is the um, the open opening page to our uh, subject guides available on American Ancestors. And if you click on one of these items, it will bring you to links to other sites. It will bring you to other databases. It'll give you a history on the topic. Um, it might even have links to helpful videos. This is an example of Marie Daly's subject guide on Irish genealogy. So if you're having trouble um, navigating, doing some Irish research, this is a great page for you to go to to learn about the resources that are available. So the records that are available for you to determine place of birth, parents' names, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another site that does a fantastic job on this is uh, Family Search. They have something very similar to the subject guides that we have here at American Ancestors. They're calling it the Family Search Research Wiki. And there's a variety of topics that they have listed on there. Um, again, they're incredibly helpful compiled sources that help to explain difficult subject matter. Uh, some of the best wikis that I uh, ha have used on Family Search are helping with foreign languages and uh, handwriting. So, for example, here this is a, a quick guide into reading old German handwriting. Uh, not, I mean, this should help you out a little bit. German handwriting is very difficult to read, uh, but this is just another tool that you can use to help you discover more about a record group or record um, type for your ancestor. All right, step five. Now we're on to the fun part. We actually get to research. <laughs> so once you've determined the records that you'll uh, like, that will likely contain the information that you're looking for, and you've written down the records on your log and where you're going to find them, you can now begin researching. And remember, you should always make notes on your research log whether you are finding something or not finding something. Okay, so let's try this strategy together. We're going to work together to create a research plan, and then we're also going to execute the plan to discover the parents of William Henry Brown. William Henry Brown just happens to be my great-grandfather. We're going to remember the steps that we just went over. So we're going to organize ourselves. We're going to look for that missing information. So what are we trying to discover? We're going to list the records that will aid us in our research. We're going to find those resources. Uh, and then we're going to actually do the research. So step five is the research process. All right. So step number one, organize ourselves. So going back to our genealogical principle, what do we know about William Henry Brown? Well, the first record that I found during my research, my own genealogical research, for William Henry Brown was on the death record of his son, Chester Brown. And I'm just, I'm giving you a freebie here that, so the father's name here is listed as Henry Brown, but I promise his name's William Henry Brown. He went by Henry Brown most of the time. Uh, but, but this is the information that I have about Henry. So I know that Henry is married to Emma Massey. I know that he's born in Fairfield, Illinois, according to Chester Brown's death record. Um, and I know that he was likely married before the 21st of August, 1880. And that's what I was able to extract from this particular record. Again, we're not gonna make, we're not gonna jump to any conclusions. We're not gonna assume that they were married in Illinois just because Chester uh, was was born there and because Henry was born there and because Emma was born there, we're not gonna jump to conclusions. We're gonna systematically figure out um, how all of these events occurred. So again, what we know from the what we know from that um, that death record or that transcribed death record for Chester. We know that his son was born in Jeffersonville, Illinois on the 21st of August, 1880. We know his wife's name is Emma Massey. We know that Hen William Henry Brown was born in Fairfield, Illinois. So now that we know these facts, we want to use our second uh, genealogical principle, which is writing it down. So using one of those five generation charts, we're going to write down the information that we know about Chester Brown, 
coming from that transcribed death record, his father's name and where his father was born, as well as his mother's name and where his mother was born. And now that we know the information that we, so now that we have the known information, we now need to look for that missing information. And even though our objective here is to look for the parents of William Henry Brown, this is not the only unknown information, right? So we don't know a birth year. We don't know anything about his marriage or his death date or place. And then again, we don't know his parents' names. So the, so the obvious um, item that we don't know are the parents' names, but we need to also consider the unknown information for William because that can lead us to the final result. So the missing details can be helpful when we're trying to discover the records that will help us to answer our ultimate question. So our ultimate question being, who are the parents of William Henry Brown? So let's return to that chart that we have on AmericanAncestors.org, and we'll look at those records that will help us to answer the question about William's, William Henry Brown's parents' names. So it's included here on, on this column. So, as, so the information we need to know is the parents' names. What we should search first are vital records, census records, probates, newspapers, and then published genealogies. And we are going to look for all of these items. We are not going to look for just one of these items. Because the more information that we have about an individual, the better that information is. So we want to make sure that we are finding several records that are um, giving us the same information, that are corroborating the information that we have for William Henry. And the way that we do that is by finding several records that are, are reiterating that information for us. So we're going to start setting up our log based on the information that so based on wh what's listed on that that list there so we're going to look for vital records we're going to have a column here for the name dates examined place relevant record notes and the objective but we're going to give ourselves some space to look for several vital records we're going to do the same for census records we're going to also look for newspapers and for probates so we're going to think about that when we're setting up our research log, that those are our main objectives. But we need to figure out if we can actually find this stuff. Does this stuff even exist? Do these records exist? And this might be the case for, for you know, depending on how far back you go in your genealogy, there might not be a census record for someone. They might not have started yet. There might not be a vital record for someone. We need to determine if one exists or not. So we're going to think about the, informations, the information that is available for these records. So we're going to return to the Family Search Wiki or the American Ancestors subject, subject Guides to figure out uh, what exists and where it's held. And then we're going to add these relevant records to our research log. So in this case, we know based on that chart, that we should be looking for some vital records to get us the information on William Henry Brown's parents. So we're going to add a birth record. We're going to add a marriage record. We're not going to add a death record yet because we have no idea when he died. That's going to be some information that we find going forward. We know that we're going to be looking for William Henry Brown. We know that for the marriage record, we're going to be looking for William Henry Brown and Emma Massey. If there's any variant spellings on names, you should be including those on that um, in this column here. We know that they were likely married before 1880 because that's the date of birth for their son Chester. Um, we don't really know about the place but we can keep that as unknown for right now. We're also going to include information about census records. Again we're going to include the 1900 census and the 1880 census because we know that they likely were living at that time. We know Chester's born in 1880, so he might be included on a census record with them. 
but most likely he's on a 1900 census with them. So we want to be looking for those two, first two censuses to begin with. However, as time goes on, we're going to be looking for the whole gamut of, of um, census records for a particular individual. We don't want to skip over any record group that exists. We also included probate records because those are on the, the list uh, that Anne put together for getting started, as well as an obituary for um, Henry, William Henry Brown, as well as published genealogies. So again, we're making this list just based off of the types of records that are going to give us the information that we're looking for. We don't necessarily know where we're going to find them at this point, but we're going to put those records down so that we know to look for them. We're going to continue to look for them so that we, we um, encourage ourselves to do so and don't, we don't skip to the next generation. So now we're going to research. And we're going to research each item on that log. We're not going to move on until we've found each of these items, or at least we've made an attempt to find each of these items. So this is the research process now. So as I mentioned, uh, we know that Chester was born in 1880. Because a census was taken in 1880, and because we don't know exactly when he was born, um, we're going to skip on to the 1900 census. Because it's very likely that Chester was listed on the 1900 census with his parents, as long as they're still living and he's not married. So we're going to look for them on familysearch.org. I'm going to include the information on William Henry Brown. We don't know much about his, uh, we don't know how old he is or when he was born, uh, so we're not going to include that information, but we are going to include the name of his spouse, as well as Chester, because he's probably another person that's listed on the census with him. When we do the search, we find him on the 1900 census. And the reason that we wanted to do this first, looking for Chester with William Brown, um, is that William Brown is a very common name, especially in Illinois at that time period. So we want to be sure that we're looking for, we want to be sure that we're finding the right person. Um, so we know that if we find a household with a Henry Brown and then with a Chester, that we likely have the correct household. So this is them. Uh, they're living in Lamar Township, which is in Wayne County, Illinois. We can tell from the census record that uh, Henry was born in January of 1850. He was married at the age of 23, which makes his, um, his marriage year 1873. And we can tell from the, the census also that he was born in Illinois, his father was born in Ohio, and his mom is born in Tennessee. So this is a lot more information than we knew about William Henry Brown prior to finding him on the census record. We know a lot more information about um, his vitals uh, based on this information. So now we can start looking for some vital records, at least in, in terms of, of this example. If you were doing this research on your own, I would say now you need to find all of the census records that are relevant to William Henry Brown, because you might find that some censuses are giving you different information. I'm sure that we've all run into this before, where a census is not totally accurate, which is probably due to the fact that the enumerator was given bad information or that they wrote down the wrong information. Um, Nonetheless, we should be looking for all of the census records for a particular individual. So those should all be included on your log so that you know to look for all of those census records. For our purposes, we're going to update the log based on our finding. So we're going to say that we found a relevant record, that we found it in Lamard, which is in Wayne County, Illinois. Um, and then we're going to include the information that will help us to uh, identify the parents of William Henry Brown. We know that he is now born January of 1850. We know that he was married in 1877. We know that his father was born in Ohio and his mom is born in Tennessee. So now that we have that information, we can move forward and we can start looking for some other vital records. Now we saw from the chart that we should be looking for vital records, both birth and marriage, correct? So birth is listed here. We don't, well, we now know that he's born in 1850, so we can start looking for that. And then the marriage record, we can start looking for it in 
1877, 1876. However, we don't know what kind of records uh, were recorded in Illinois at the time. And I haven't memorized all of the state's vital record laws. So I will look at the wiki site to find information about Illin the um, history on Illinois vital records. Family Search has created this wonderful little chart here so we can see that the earliest births that were recorded in Illinois start about 1877. Since our guy is born in 1850, most likely we are not going to find a birth record uh, for him, at least on the civil uh, level. We may find a church record for him, um, but we're, we're most likely not going to find a civil record. Uh, especially because statewide registration happens in 1916 and general compliance is in 1922. So then we move on. So then we say marriages. Well, statewide registration isn't until 1962, but we're, we're given a glimmer of hope here with the county formation being the earliest of the marriage records. So that's probably a, the best option for us to start with is to look for a marriage record for William Henry Brown and for um, Emma Massey. So we discover where they are using our Family Search wiki. They're available on Family Search. Here we find a listing for William Henry Brown. He's marrying Emma Massey in Clay, Illinois. He's 26 years old. So again, we're, we're getting an estimated um, age at birth, I'm sorry, year at birth at 1850. Um, his spouse is born about 1856. But this is all the information that is listed. And we can tell, using context clues, that this is not the original record, right? So this is not the original 1876 record. This is something that was created by an individual using a computer to extract the information from the original record and creating this, this new transcribed record. The original record is available somewhere. And one of the places that you always want to check when you're looking on family search is this this number here where it says gs film number because that record might actually be available the original record might actually be available it might be digitized but it might not have been indexed so what do i mean by that so when you when a record is indexed that means that when you fill out when you put the names in these boxes here and you do a search it will bring you to that direct record if something's been digitized and not entirely indexed, um, then it's not going to appear when you're first searching, but you can still get to it manually. And I'm going to kind of show you how to do that. So the, the good news is, is that, that that GS film number is given, so we can check to see if the original exists. And why do I keep harping on this? Because you always want to look at the original. The original record is going to give you more information nine times out of ten than that transcription does. There's always information that's included on there uh, that might not have been included on the transcription for whatever reason. There might not have been, there might be privacy laws for it. Um, there might be, uh, you know, not enough fields for the, for the transcriber to include that when they're indexing it. Whatever it might be, there's going to be more information on that original record. So we want to find the original. That's the most important. So we go on to Family Search. We go, well, we're still on Family Search, but we go into the catalog. So we're going to choose the catalog on the top here. Uh, and we're going to search for the film number. So we put that GS film number that was included on the record that we found for William Henry Brown and Emma Massey. And when we put that film number in and we search for it, uh, we get a hit. And it gives us this description. So we can see here that there's four collections. The one that's going to apply to us is this one here, volumes B through D, because uh, it covers the time frame that we're looking for. But you'll notice here on the side, the, the format column, there's a magnifying glass and there's a camera. If you click on the magnifying glass, it will be, bring you back to the transcribed record for William Henry Brown and you will just keep going in circles. So we don't want to do that. We want to click on the camera. The camera will bring you to the digitized reel of film. Um, it's not going to be searchable, but we're going to be able to figure out what page it's on based on the index by the um, database notes. So you see on the top here where it says that this is microfilmed of the original record in, at the Clay County Courthouse and that there are indexes at the beginning of the volumes. 
So whenever you click on this camera here, that one of the first couple pages is going to be an index to the entire volume. That's very important when you're looking at, at a large number of uh, scans. So when we did that for William Henry Brown and Emma Massey, we, we browsed to the original, which is page, uh, which is image number 784 of 962, which is why we want to look at that index at the beginning so that we're not wasting our time looking through all these records. Um, but the, the important part about this is that it's giving us so much more information about the marriage. So we find here that they were married by a uh, Methodist pre uh, minister. We know his name. But more importantly, they give us information about where the couple is from. So this says that William Henry Brown is from Lamard in the county of Wayne, and that Emma Massey is from Clay City in Clay County. That is not information that was included on the transcription. So because we know that William Henry Brown was from Wayne County, always from Wayne County, we might be skeptical of that transcribed record because it doesn't give us the same location. But now that we've looked at the original, we can be confident that this is for our guy. This is who we're looking for. And again, every time we find something or we don't find something, we want to update that finding on our uh, research log. So here we're going to do that. We're going to include the marriage record of uh, William Henry Brown and Emma Massey. We're going to say that it does not include the uh, names of his parents because that's ultimately what we're looking for, right? So we want to include that information um, in that column there so that we don't go looking for it again. So the next thing that we want to look for, because we can't find a birth record, it likely doesn't exist, we found the marriage record. The next thing to look for is a death record. So when we do that, we find that the, um, and this is going to be different for every state that we're looking at, but you just want to, uh, if, if you look at the, at the Family Search Wiki or the American Ancestor Subject Guides, it will bring you to information about where to find uh, records based on the type and also the year. Um, so we were able to figure out, looking at the Family Search Wiki for Illinois, that there was death records that would be available at the um, Secretary of State's office. So again, this is an index record for William Henry Brown. We find where he dies. He dies in um, Effingham County, which is uh, Mason City in Effingham County. Uh, the age matches for what we know about him. So we're pretty confident that this, this, is a, this is a good record for us to look at. But we need to look at the original. And you need to be persistent about looking at that original. Because the original will get you, hopefully, um, to, you know, to the record that you're looking for, or the information that you're looking for. So, because I was persistent, um, I contacted the county clerk in Effingham County and asked them to look through their records to try to find us a copy of the death record for William Henry Brown. And guess what? Uh, they found it. So what you need to always remember, too, when you're being persistent is that not everything is going to be online. Not everything is going to be knowable online. Uh, it's always worth picking up the phone and calling the local town town clerk, the local town hall, the li a local librarian, because they might be able to help you navigate uh, some of the smaller collections that are held on the local level. So here, when we get the, the original uh, county copy of the 1915 death record, we see that William Henry Brown is listed. His birthplace is listed as Jefferson, Illinois which is different information than what was on the death record of his son, which is typical for uh, death records uh, to have slightly uh, inaccurate information. So it's something that you want to keep in mind moving forward, that you um, should always be um, skeptical and analytical of the information that's included on um, death records, because they're the person who's dying is not including that information themselves. Nonetheless, if we look here, we can find that the name of William Henry Brown's father is Emanuel Brown, his birthplace is Stark County, Ohio, and that his mom's name is uh, Baker. His mom's maiden name is Baker. So when we think about this, the informant here is Ray M. Brown. I can tell you that Ray M. Brown is, his, is William Henry Brown's uh, grandson. So when we're looking at this record, we need to get really excited 
because we just found the, the names of the parents, but we also need to be uh, considerate of the information that's on that record. So you want to be thinking about whether or not this is an original or a copy. So in some cases, uh, we're going to find the uh, town copy to be maybe more accurate than the state copy. Um, how is the information organized? Could the information be incorrect? So how far removed is uh, the record from the event? And then who's providing that information? That's really important when we're looking um, at a record to be uh, considerate of the information that's included there. So how accurate is it? For our purposes, we're going to say it's accurate. <laughs> so we're going to update our findings on our um, research log. Again, because we're writing everything down. Uh, so we're going to include where the death occurred. We're going to say that we found a relevant record. Uh, and then we're also going to have some notes here that the, um, the original 10 June 1950 death record indicated that he was the son of Emmanuel Brown and a woman named Baker, and that he was born in Jefferson, Illinois. Again, we're always writing stuff down. Something to be considering is that we need to be methodical. Again, I'm going to say this over and over again, is that when, you're in, when, you, when you include something on your log, you then need to follow through on that, that item that's on your log. You also want to consider that there might be mistakes on the records that you're looking at. So you need to follow through on all of these items that you're including on your research plan because you might find contradicting information. So the more information that you can collect, the more records that you can collect along the way, the better analysis that you're going to have of your ancestor. So let's return to th that original um, chart that we have for finding parents' names. So if we return here, we can check a few of these items off. So we've looked for the vital records for the most part, other than the birth record, which unless we find a church record, we're probably not going to find on the civil level. On the civil level, uh, we've looked for census records. For the most part, we we need to follow through on all of those other census records, as I mentioned. But now we're going to move on to the final three. So we're going to find a probate record, newspapers, and published genealogies. Before we do that, though, we're going to update our research log. Because we need to know where we're looking for something and then what we're looking for. So we're going to look for probates, we're going to look for uh, newspapers, and we're going to look for published genealogies. Now, I can tell you, we started looking for the probate records. We started looking in Wayne County, but there was nothing available online, readily available online um, for Wayne County, Illinois. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we just stop looking? No, it means that we start looking on the on the local level. So we contact the county and we see if there's an option of, of viewing the original record. Are there uh, opportunities to maybe make photocopies of that record? Do you need to visit the county in person? If not, can you write a letter? Can you um, include payment? Uh, you need to contact the county and get all of this information uh, so that you can get a a copy of the original probate record because the original probate record for Emmanuel Brown might mention that his son William Henry Brown um, was included as one of his heirs so that might just be one other way of uh, finding information about a particular or solidifying that information about the uh, parents of w William Henry Brown so we want to update the the log based on us contacting the county and if we say in our notes here that the probate is unavailable online and that we have to contact the circuit court for a possible record, you will be happy that you did that. Um, also, if you contact them either via email or by letter or by phone, I would also recommend putting the date that you did that on that particular note field. Uh, because in two to three weeks, when you come to revisit this again, you can remember how long it has been since you um, have heard from the, the from the circuit court. So now we're going to move on to newspapers, because it's possible that an obituary for William Henry Brown would reiterate who his parents are. 
So we can search some of these databases. We can look on Genealogy Bank, newspapers.com, newspaper archive. Most of these are uh, paid sites. Um, but if you're not able to find something on one of these paid sites, or if you or if you don't want to pay for a site, um, there's always the option of finding microfilmed records of the local newspapers. And something that I love recommending for this uh, is the Chronicling America uh, newspaper database that's run by the Library of Congress. What they've done, it, first off, it's free, uh, and they have a very comprehensive uh, catalog of the records that are available for a particular um, location. So what we want to do is uh, search by the location to find the records that are that are available for a particular location. Um, so we want to look in Effingham County because that's the county where uh, William dies. Uh, and when we do this, we can see that there's some options. It's giving us the option to search for both Effingham and then Eff Effingham County and then also Effingham the city. Uh, and when we search for it, we find several different options and they're giving us everything. Uh, so even if a newspaper ran for one year or even for uh, six months, they'll be included on this list. Um, and we have 20 23 options of uh, newspapers to look for. Now, in the case of William Henry Brown, we're most interested in number 10 because it's covering the time frame um, that he died. So if we click there, it will bring us to the note on that particular uh, newspaper. So the publisher's name, the language that the newspaper is printed in, uh, what the coverage was, the years that it ran, uh, all of that information will be included on this on this record here. But most importantly um, is the list of libraries that have it. Um, and when you click on that particular hyperlink, it will bring you to a listing of all of the libraries that own that particular uh, copy. Now there might be a microfilm copy, there might be um, the original copies. But in this case, the county review is held at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. Uh, so you can click to see uh, the microfilm status of that particular item. And it doesn't always mean that you need to actually visit the library. So what you want to do is you want to go to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library website. You want to see if there's a genealogy tab, which in this case there is. Um, and then it also gives you the, the option of looking for newspapers on microfilm. So when we clicked there, we were wonderfully surprised that they have instructions on how to uh, order microfilm via interlibrary loan. So you don't even need to visit the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, even though I'm sure it's lovely. Uh, you can get the microfilmed copies via interlibrary loan, which is how you can help yourself find the newspaper obituary for William Henry Brown. Now, even though we're not going to do it right, so we're not going to be able to search that item immediately, we can say in our notes field that we ordered the microfilm from the, pub, from the Abraham Lincoln uh, Presidential Library. Uh, we can even say the date that that happened, uh, and then also reminding ourselves what we're looking for, so the objective in that particular item. So finally, the last step, now that we've looked at vital records, newspapers, uh, census records, probates, we're going to move on to published genealogies. But since published genealogies for the Brown family in Illinois are going to be uh, plentiful, the recommendation that I would have would be to look for a, uh, a published county history uh, for Wayne County. And we know that the Browns are from Wayne County. So to do that, we're going to look at the American Ancestors Library Catalog, searching by subject Wayne County, Illinois. And happily, we get a hit on the history of Wayne County. It also involves Clay County, which is where um, Henry and Emma were married, so that's probably extra helpful. Um, this is not available online, but you'll see here that there's a Request Photocopies button. Um, and if you want to do that, you can request the photocopies through Research Services. Uh, they will look through the book for you uh, and tell you if one of your ancestors is included there. They'll look through the index. Um, and if we find any photo, any items, we will make scans of those copies and then send them along to you. Uh, and if you are a member of NEHGS, you get 25 free scans a year. So this is a service that you should probably take advantage of, especially if you're not in the New England area. And again, 
as I've said a million times, we are now going to add that item to our log. And as you can see now, our log is getting rather large. Uh, so we can see the published genealogy here and that we're going to look at it at NEHGS. It's not available online, it's on the fifth floor. And then we include the call number there uh, for us to review that at a later date, whether we're coming to use the library or whether we're ordering something through research services. So my final tip is going to be that you should make some notes on your log about the, we've been talking about this, about the reliability of a record. Because it's really important um, that you understand whether a record is um, definitively true or um, if we should be taking some of the information with a grain of salt. So the most important things to consider are, is this original record or is it a copy of a record? The original is going to be better, obviously, than the copy. The individual who is reporting uh, the information, so in the case of a death record or a marriage record, the marriage record is going to be better because it's most likely coming from the individual who's living. Whereas if it's an informant giving that information, such as on a death record, that information will be less um, accurate. Uh, if the record is close to the event, it will be more accurate than if it's uh, far removed. So a cemetery stone, for example, giving the birth date, uh, birth year, that can sometimes be uh, not as accurate. Um, and then there's some others like an educated clerk versus an uneducated clerk uh, or a reliable source versus an unsighted source. So if you find some of those older genealogies that are not cited, uh, those can, t can sometimes be um, a little sketchy. Now what I like to do because your logs get to be very verbose is to use a coloring system to indicate the, the record strength. Um, and I just used the you know colors that we use driving daily. Um, so I use red to say that something is unreliable and then all the way up to green being um, good. And then uh, acceptable, and, and acceptable and good are kind of in the, the yellow um, area. So, I will color code my log based on the reliability of the record. This is a nice way to quickly look at your log um, to figure out the strength of each record. Uh, this can save you time when you're researching. Um, as you can, can you, as you can determine the definitive information from something uh, that might be a, a little bit more flimsy. So to review. The steps in order to creating a great research plan are to organize yourself, to look for missing information, list the records that will aid in your research, all of the records, not just the ones that you want to look for, um, all of the records that will help you to um, determine the research question that you're trying to solve, find the resources, research, the fun part, and then analyze and make your conclusions. So the analysis can happen um, at the end or during, it doesn't matter, uh, but that's when you can start color coding your uh, log based on what you're able to find. All right, thank you so much, Lindsay, that was fantastic. Uh, now let's tackle your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask, go ahead and type it into the questions panel and answer, and Lindsay will try to answer as many as she can in the time provided. Um, you know, we're just about at the the top of the hour, but we'll we'll answer a few questions here. Um, and as I mentioned at the start of the presentation, those that are more general, um, we'll we'll tackle first. So um, a few questions about how to kind of organize your research logs. Um, should the research log be created for each person? each surname or family, or do you usually do a research log per question or genealogical issue that you're having? I tend to use one log per surname. Um, that just helps me stay more organized than include. So if we start including more surnames, then it starts to get a little uh, iffy. Uh, the nice part about Excel is that it gives you the option of creating more tabs on uh, so you can create you know several different research plans and name them the surname 
Um, so, so that can be can be very helpful and help to to stay organized and maybe not create a huge gargantuan log uh, that's that's hard for you to look at. Um, a nice another nice part about an Excel sheet is that it helps you to uh, sort what you're looking at. So, if you wanted to look at I don't know all of the William Browns that you were able to find, in, uh, you know, on a baptismal record. Um, then you can you can use Excel to kind of navigate that item. Um, I but I like to I like to use just surnames for that rather than a particular question. If you do questions, that's usually something when you're trying to like if you're trying to break down a brick wall and you're you're really looking at everything in the kitchen sink to try to answer it, then I would say maybe use a separate log for that. Um, but if you're just doing general research um, on a particular family, then I would say use just a, the surname. Um, and a few questions about including citation information. Um, would you include a full citation in your research log, perhaps as a separate column? Um, also hyperlinks, you know, if you are finding this information online, um, would you recommend including a hyperlink to, to the resource? I love both of those ideas. Yes, I think you should always be including uh, citation information because again, you're not gonna remember where you're finding uh, this information. Um, so that's important to include. Uh, hyperlinks are great as as long, but I would definitely still include the the footnoted citation or the citation information just in case that hyperlink changes and you know the URL doesn't work anymore. Um, there are there are several times where I've been looking at something on like Family Search, for example, that was available one day and then wasn't available the next week. Uh, so so that can kind of get frustrating. Um, so another idea that you might might have is maybe creating a PDF of that particular record and then and then attaching that uh, you know to the item. That's also a great way of of keeping organized you know what you have on a particular person. And also printing something out and um, attaching it to a printed research log is, is perfectly fine as well. Um, I know that you have, uh, there are a number of questions about um, access to the recording of this presentation, to the subject guides and the tools that we showed throughout the presentation. Um, the recording will be posted um, very shortly after we conclude today and access to that recording, to the downloads, the research log that we showed, um, the other templates and the subject guides. You do not have to be um, a paid member of NEHGS to access those, but you do need to have at least a free guest account in which you can easily create on our website and uh, the guest account also gives you access to a number of searchable databases. Um, I believe that there are 15 or 20 searchable databases that you would have access to as a, as a guest user as well. So lots of benefits there. Um, another question, uh, so Cecilia notes that, you know, looking at one source often suggests another source. So rather than going down every rabbit hole when something comes up, um, how do you make a note to yourself? Um, how do you kind of record that information or that next step to take? Well, so, so uh, you know, this happens to us all the time. This is why we're even talking about creating a research plan because we've all run into, you know, looking at the 1920 census, you're trying to find William Henry Brown and then you find six other Brown families in, in the meantime. Um, and that's, important for you to do while you're analyzing that particular census record. You should be looking at neighbors, you should be looking at the page before and the page after uh, of, a, of a particular document. So that's good. You, you should definitely keep up that work. However, if you're trying to stay on task, I would say, especially if you're going to use something like um, a well, you should be using a research log. I would say at that point, either print out a research log that has that new family on it so that you know to go back to it. Um, or if you're using the Excel example, then you can create a new sheet and then and start a new family name there uh, just so that you know to go back to that particular family. I wouldn't look at it at that exact moment. 
um, just because you need to go through all of the items that you included on your research log first before you start worrying about another family. It might end up working out for you in the end. Uh, you know, that other family might end up solving your problem, but it's really important to see all of those records through to the end so that you're really crossing off everything uh, and making sure that you're, cre you're building the best case, um, you know, for your ancestor. Um, and I also see a few questions about, um, you know, do you need to keep a, a research log uh, on a computer? Does it have to be digital? Of course not. You can, um, that research log template that Lindsay showed closer to the start of the presentation that's available on our website, you can print that off and just handwrite it and, you know, continue to kind of add notes to it. Um, maybe use a pencil. <laughs> instead of a pen because you will be adding to it as you go but certainly um, a paper research log is just as just as great um, now Marjorie has a great question you know so the presentation today was focusing on kind of a working process um, as you research and she asks so once you've done the research and you've come to a great conclusion where and how do you record that final source that provides the data that you'll consider correct thereafter well, you likely won't find one source that's getting you to the conclusion, but um, I, th I think I understand the, the general question being like, what if, you, what if you find a couple things that are not helpful or they're incorrect or they're a little sketchy? Um, and, and what do you do with the records that are better and providing more accurate information? Um, I would say that if you know if you have something like a genealogical uh, software program then that's something that you should be saving to it indicating that that is a uh, a high record in your um, you know in your collection and then maybe something that is not as accurate then you can label it you know in such a way what we tend to do in research services when we are, so usually what we're working on, uh, we're working on a very difficult genealogical problem. Uh, and once we do all of the research and we create our research log and we go through all of it and we, we've compiled all the information, then we do what we call a proof argument, um, which is generally, if you've seen what we've done in the uh, register, uh, it's usually a, uh, genealogical summary of the person so uh, you know the the person's name when they were born when they were married when they died if there's any uh, you know occupational information or if they served in the military we'd include that there there would be information about the wife as well as the children and then after that we would have a discussion on you know the records that we were able to find what we weren't able to find what was what was inaccurate and what was more accurate. So there's a there's an analysis done um, after that. All of the footnotes and citations can be included there. Um, and if you wanted to include even um, hard copies of it, you know, you could have that as well. Uh, we do this for, we don't necessarily do this for the register. Um, it's something that we give to the members that are using our service uh, if, if they need one for like applying to Mayflower or something like that, you know, where they need a definitive document that shows the conclusion. Um, but you can do the same thing. Uh, I think that that would be great, especially if you're solving a very complex genealogical problem uh, where you need several documents to, to prove your point and also where you need to remove some documents because they weren't as accurate. And I think kind of following up with that question, and, and I know, Lindsay, you and I have kind of talked about this in the past too, but um, so Susan is asking, you know, should I leave unverified information off my, say, Ancestry.com tree? Um, and should I just, after I've kind of done all this background research and um, kept a research log and found great records and come to a conclusion, should I only then maybe add it to, to my tree or to my chart, my final chart? I would say yes, that that, but that needs to be, whatever you decide to do, that needs to be consistent. So if you're going to, use your Ancestry.com tree for just verified information, um, and we know that that doesn't always happen, uh, <laughs> but if you're going to be uh, one of the ones that's using it just for verified 
documents and information, then that's great, but that should just be, that's what you should be doing all the time. Um, there shouldn't be anything in there that you're a little skeptical about that shouldn't make it to that particular, um, you know, database. Um, and I would do the same thing for really literally anything else. So if you're going to be creating a chart and you're only going to be putting information on there that's verified, then stuff that is not verified should not make it to that. Um, and that should really only be, uh, that should only be included on your research log so that you can remember that it exists um, and that you've looked at it, but understanding that that is not definitive information. All right, and maybe one final question. I think this is a good one to end with. Um, Rebecca asks, how often do you revisit your conclusions and the analysis that led you to that conclusion? Well, <laughs> every time I do a webinar, I, <laughs> I end up reviewing the, what I've done previously, and then sometimes I find mistakes in it, especially when you start doing a really big deep dive into um, the records that you're looking at. That was actually something that occurred when I put together a version of, of this topic. Um, I was talking about William Henry Brown. I thought that I had his death record. Um, everything matched. He was, he was married to a, the death record indicated that he was married to a Massey. So it was a lot of um, boxes that were checked. But once I started doing the methodical research of finding absolutely every item for him, then I figured out that I had the completely wrong death record. Um, so that's why it's most important to do the methodical search. Once you do a methodical search, you should really have your conclusion and you should be confident on it. Uh, but as long as you've done it all, that's the most important aspect of this, is that you can't just say, well, because I found a marriage record that has parents on it, it's got to be accurate and I'm moving on. That's not the best way of going about it. It's, the best way is doing that methodical search, finding absolutely every record that that could exist for your ancestor, um, and then it, you know analyzing all of that and making sure that our, your conclusion um, is jiving with with what you're finding. All right. So um, I know that there were a lot of questions that we didn't get to, um, but if you'd like hands-on help with your research, you may want to consider scheduling a consultation with one of our experts or hiring our research services team. And if you're interested in learning more about those services, you can write to the email addresses on the current slide or visit our website, AmericanAncestors.org. I'll also include the, that information in my follow-up email to you uh, later today. So thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.